We've looked at requests so far, and we've understood what resource URIs are and what HTTP methods we need to use are. Now let's switch our focus to responses. So we've learned where to make the request, which is the resource URI, and how to make the request, which is what HTTP method to use. So let's start looking at what the responses should be. When a request comes in, what should the REST web service respond with? Knowing what the client will get back from the server is an important part of the API because the client needs to write code to handle that response. Now, if this were a web application, we know that the response you would be a HTML page, right? With styling, formatting, and also, of course, the actual data in a presentable format. But when it comes to RESTful web services, you don't need to do all the styling and the formatting anymore. You just need to send the actual data. Now, how do you send it? We discussed about various standard formats that the responses can be sent in, like XML and JSON. JSON has been growing in popularity recently because it's much more compact and less verbose when compared to XML, especially when you have a large amount of data. So it's gaining in popularity. And also, more often than not, a client to a RESTful API happens to be a browser, right? It's a piece of JavaScript code which is running in a browser which makes these REST API calls. So sending a response back in JSON makes it really easy for that JavaScript client to convert that response to a JavaScript object. So it's very handy if the response is in JSON. So considering all these advantages, we'll choose JSON as the response for our Messenger application in this course. However, note that you don't typically need to settle for just one format. You could write APIs which return both XML and JSON, right? There could be multiple response formats. And we'll implement one such API, uh, you know, one such endpoint later in this course to illustrate this. But for the most part, we'll be using JSON in this course. So let's look at the format itself. Uh, let's say our message entity class has these four member variables the ID of the message, the text of the message, when it was created, and who created it, right? Four simple properties. When a GET request is made for a specific message, say a message ID 10, the JSON that you would return to the client would look something like this. You again have the four properties with the values for each of those properties. But the response doesn't have to be JSON. You could return XML as well if the client asks for an XML format. We haven't covered how a client could ask for any specific format. We'll look at that later. But yes, a client can say, I need a JSON response or I need an XML response. Now, if the server were to return the same message uh, instance in an XML format, it would probably look something like this. We have the same message entity the same values, but in a different format, right? It's in an XML format. Now, clearly the JSON response and the XML response are different, right? The format is different, but they still represent the same resource. They still represent a particular message, which is message ID 10. In other words, these responses are different representations of the same resource. This is actually a very important thing to remember. When you make REST API calls, you're sending or receiving representations of the resource. Different representations could have different formats, even though the underlying resource is the same. This is actually how REST gets its name. REST stands for representational state transfer. So you're transferring the representational state, okay? When you make REST API calls, you're sending or receiving representations of a resource. Okay, so now it's great that a REST web service can return data in XML or JSON or a different format, but that brings up a problem. How does a client know what format the response is in? The client can of course request data in a particular format, but there's no guarantee that the server returns it in that format. So let's say a client asks for XML, but the REST service knows only JSON, it could return JSON, ignoring the client's preference for XML. Again, this is something we're gonna talk about a bit later, but 
the client doesn't necessarily know beforehand what the returned response format is, okay? So how does a client know what that format is? How does it figure out how to parse it? The answer is using HTTP headers. The HTTP protocol has a concept of request and response headers. Every HTTP request or response has the body which contains the message itself, the request message or the response message. And it also contains certain header values which, which have information about the metadata of the message, right? The header data could be stuff like the length of the content or the date or things like that. One such possible header is called the content type. The response could contain a content type header value with the value being JSON or XML, which basically it, it details what the format of the message is. There are special values for JSON or XML, and we'll learn more about how to implement this uh, when we actually write code. But know that the type of content being sent back is an information that's available in the header. So when the client gets a response, it examines the header for this value, the content type value, and then depending on what the content type value is, it can parse the response body accordingly, whether it's XML or JSON or anything like that. Let's look at status codes. Think about error messages in a web application, in a standard web application. When something goes wrong, an application typically returns a page with an error message, maybe in bold red text. Even if the font isn't red, the message itself would give the user an idea that there is actually an error. But in the case of REST API, since the consumer is not a human, we need to provide some other mechanism for letting the client know what the status of the response is, right? There needs to be some other way to send information to the client to help them identify if there is an error or not, and if there is an error, what are the error scenarios that could have happened. The way to do this is by using status codes. The HTTP specification requires the very first line of the response to be a status line. This line will have a numerical code and a short phrase explaining what that code means. This is not just for errors. Every HTTP response needs to have this line. If the response is successful, the very first line of the response will be 200 OK, which indicates it was successful, right? This is a success status code. Now let's take the familiar 404 error code. When a request is made to a URI, let's say for example, slash messages slash 101, and there is no message available with the ID 101, the first line of the response should be 404 not found because the server was not able to find this resource. Again, the code 404 is for the client program to read and act. The phrase not found is an aid to the programmer in case they forget what the code means. Not that any programmer would ever forget what a 404 means, but that's what it's for. There are a bunch of codes that are important for us to remember and use when writing a REST API. These codes start from 100 and go up to 599. Not all of them are valid codes though, so you don't have 500 different possible codes. There are basically five classes of these status codes, and the first digit indicates what class the code belongs to, one through five. So the codes starting with the digit one are informational codes, like acknowledgement responses. We'll not be using these codes in this course. The codes starting with two are success codes. They indicate that the server received a request from the client and processed it successfully. We've already seen 200 OK indicates a successful response. You return this for any request that you are able to successfully respond to. But there are some other 200 codes, like 201 created. This indicates successful resource creation. Let's say you get a post request on a collection URI like slash messages and you were successfully able to create that message. You could return 200 OK saying it's a success response, but a better response code would be 201 created, which specifically stands for a creation acknowledgement, right? You are, you are, you're telling the client that you are successfully able to create that resource. 
there is a 204 no content which you use when you don't really need to send any content back. Uh, for example, a delete request. When you get a delete request, you delete the resource. You don't have anything to send back, right? Because the resource is deleted. You just have to send back an acknowledgement. So you could return 200 okay again with no message body, but you could also send 204 no, con no content, which makes it really obvious to the client that the server really intended to send nothing back. Okay, so those are the 200 codes, the codes starting with two, which are success codes. The codes starting with the digit three are redirection codes. These codes are used by the server to ask the client to do further action to complete the request. For example, it could be a redirect asking the client to send the request somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So the codes 302 found or 307 temporary redirect are one of the two error codes sent by the server to ask the client to say, hey, don't ask me, ask this other URL, right? It's a redirect. 304 not modified is an error code uh, which the server sends when it needs to tell the client that there is nothing that has been modified, right? Let's say the client tries to get a resource that it's already got before. Now the server can send the status code and say, hey, I've already given you this resource a little while back and nothing has changed since then, right? So that's when you send a 304 rather than sending the whole response again. So those are the 300 codes. There are much more uh, than what's in this list that I'm covering. I'm looking at the more important ones. You can uh, look up uh, the complete list of codes for a more comprehensive list. Okay, so the 400 codes indicate client error. These error codes are returned if the client makes an error in the request. The request syntax could have been incorrect or the client is requesting something that it's not supposed to see. So there's 400 bad requests, which is a blanket client error. The server is really not able to understand the request. There is 401 unauthorized, which which means that the client needs to sign in or authorize themselves to see the resource. There is 403 forbidden, which means that the client may have authorized or locked in, but they're not allowed to make this resource request, right? They don't have the right access or something like that. There's 404 not found, no description required. 415 unsupported media type, which means that the client is speaking in a language that the server cannot understand, some format that the server cannot understand. So the, the server just responds with, 415 unsupported media type. Okay, so finally, the 500 codes indicate server error, right? The 400 codes are when the client screws up something when sending the request. The 500 codes are when the server screws up something when sending the response back, right? So it's basically the server saying, okay, I got your request. It looked like a valid one, but something went wrong when I tried to process it. So it returns the 500 codes. So the popular 500 error code is uh, 500, internal server error. This is a generic error code. The server gets a request, the resource exists, or otherwise you would have got a 404, right? So the server is able to find the resource, but something went wrong when processing the request. In this case, the standard practice is to send the error code 500 along with the error details in the body of the response. There are a bunch of other codes, again, like I said, but these are the important ones to remember. We'll look at more when we start implementing some of these APIs. But let me remind you again, these codes are for you as a web service developer to use, right? The clients already know what this means when they see one of these error codes. So it's up to you to send the right error codes when these events happen. For example, let's say you get a runtime exception when processing a request you need to send back the error code 500 because this means server error. And when you send it back, the client will know what, what has happened. Now here are some scenarios for uh, the CRUD use cases that we saw in the previous tutorial. And we'll identify the status codes for each message resource. So you have messages slash message ID. We do a get, you return success 200. Uh, if everything goes well, we return a 404 when you're not able to find the message ID, or you return 500 if something goes wrong on the server. Delete message, again, if you are able to delete successfully, you return 200 okay or 204 no content if everything goes well. You return a 404 if you're not able to find this resource, 
and you'll return 500 if something goes wrong when you're trying to delete. Edit message, you get a put for the message instance resource ID. You return 200, okay, a success if everything goes well. You return 400 or 415 if the body of the message, body of the request you've got is not in the right format or doesn't have the right data, okay? You return 404 again if you're not able to find the message that you wanna update, and again, you return 500 if there is an error. And finally, create message. You get a post request to slash messages. You return 201 if you're able to successfully create the message. 201 is created. Again, you return 400 or 415 if the body is in the wrong format or has the wrong data, and you return 500 if there is an error in creating the, creating the resource. I hope this gives you a better idea of the status codes to be returned. Uh, responses for other resources would mostly follow the same pattern. Again, this is a small subset of the HTTP status codes, and we'll look at some more when we start implementing the APIs. To summarize, in this tutorial, we learned about resource representations, we learned about HTTP message headers, and we learned about HTTP status codes. These are things you have to keep in mind when you're developing your REST API. Thanks for watching.